Welcome to Tech and Borders, the intersection of tech, capital, and geopolitics. Russian and Ukraine war inevitably brought Alexandra Dugan, the Russian philosopher and public intellectual, and who is believed to be Putin's brain, to the spotlight. Interestingly, in the past months, Dugan also gained a large amount of attention from Chinese social media. Many Chinese political commentators, institutional or independent ones, published their work analyzing Dugan or Duganism. Surprisingly, those opinions are quite divided. Going through them, I found that the polarization on Dugan in Chinese political circle is not only interesting, but almost foretelling the future of a multipolar world that is upon us. Today, I am sharing what I discovered and my conclusion on why and how Duganism is going to be embraced in China and shape Chinese political ideology. The discoveries are organized in the following order, and they are all timestamped. First, I'd like to share a, bit, a brief understanding in Duganism, particularly his fourth political theory. And then, by comparing their interpretation on Duganism, where are the discrepancies between the liberal Chinese, meaning they have a pro-Western style of belief system, also called the Chinese right, and the Chinese mainstream media and think tanks, which is often considered the Chinese left. And by the way, the left and the right definition in Chinese political spectrum is opposite to the West, in case you have noticed. And thirdly, the contradictions between Duganism and China's orthodox belief system. And lastly, my conclusion on why and how Duganism will be embraced by Chinese leadership, both on ideology and political fronts. Why it's useful to Chinese current foreign policy, and why it foretells the future of a multipolar world with China as a player. But before I go in there, a little disclaimer here: Some people have asked me, "Am I a Chinese hawk or a Chinese dove, or am I anti-China or pro-China?" As a Chinese immigrant, I would say I have been both since I came to the States as a student. And now I am a political realist, and I consider myself an observer to China. I like to do my own independent research and share my discoveries that's often ignored or misrepresented by mainstream media, from both U.S. and China. Hence, my purpose in creating this channel, Tech and Borders, it is to compare notes. And now let's dig into Duganism and China. To understand Duganism, one needs to be familiar with his work. The fourth political theory, the pillar of his philosophy, American scholars such as Chad Hag and Michael Minerman both have done good works on it. And Michael Minerman, I believe, is known now as a Dugan expert. For the fourth political theory, if you just want a quick question course, Chad Hag, who is known for his book. Pig oil philosophy has a very good 18-page lecture on YouTube explaining fourth political theory, which I will include the link in the show notes. But here is a 30-second version of it based on Hack's lecture. According to Dugan, the 20th century was a century of ideology. Before that, there was an ideology the way as we understand it as of today in most parts of the world. Before ideology came into play. Religion, dynasties, states, classes, and nation states played an enormous role in the lives of peoples and societies. The first political theory, liberalism, it is about individual. The second political theory is communism or socialism. It's about class. The third political theory is fascism or national socialism. It's about state or race. Dugan believes. Liberalism is the only one left as a sole ideology by the end of the 20th century, encompassing the World War Sec First and the Second and the Cold War. However, he also points out the liberalism eventually disappeared and turns into a different entity, or so-called post-liberalism. It is stripped off a political dimension and it turned itself into a global market society. All other ideologies have failed to combat liberalism. Therefore, the fourth political theory is needed. In Dugan's fourth political theory, 
It squarely rejects globalization. It is against Westernism, liberalism, fascism, communism, modernism. It objects infinite progress, unipolarity, and individualism. And consequentially, of course, it is also anti-Americanism. And what does it believe? The fourth political theory believes in traditionalism, collectivism, and conservatism. It believes in multipolarity, civilizations, and very importantly, the reversibility of time or Dasein. And back on Dugan and China, in 2018. Alexandra Dugan received a high-profile invitation by a Chinese state-sponsored think tank, and he made a speech in Fudan University in Shanghai, which was hosted and aired by a well-known pro-Chinese government media outlet, and followed by another interview on CCTV. In the world, yet the political scientist and philosopher Alexander Dugin says that his native Russia has TV. Dugalism seemed well embraced by Chinese mainstream, understandably because of its anti-Americanism. It advocates a multipolar world order, which is in line with Chinese political theory. But only just the last month, when the Russian-Ukraine war broke out, the Chinese right side of political sphere, the more liberal side, started to pay attention to Dugan, and their views towards Dugalism are quite negative. Their criticism. Fell into the following conclusions. First, Dugan is Putin's brain, and Putin is a bad dictator. Therefore, P- Dugan is not good. Second, Dugalism represents Russian ex- expansionism, and China historically has lost its land to Russia. Therefore, Russia is not a friend. And thirdly, Dugan, in its、uh, Fudan speech, even he vocally said. He objects American-led unipolarism. However, Russia cannot afford a bipolar world order. With China's rising, he suggests China join the multipolar world and become a leader alongside Russia. Some Chinese are suspicious about it and believe this is to lure China to be on Russia's side and warning Chinese don't buy into it. Although it's not hard to find that Dugan's multipolarism is a pillar of his philosophy since early on, not just a change change the narrative after the fall of Soviet Union. This criticism seems overly simplified, if not polarized. For example, on Dugan is Putin's brain. Many Russian study scholars. Believe it's an exaggerated statement, and Dugan himself has openly admitted he doesn't see Putin very often over the years because he believes Putin is a realist and himself is an idealist. So, if we leave out these overly simplified conclusions on Dugan from Chinese perspectives and take a deeper look, we will find Duganism both contradicts and embraces Chinese orthodox ideology. And from there, we might actually understand where China is going post the, the COVID era and during its fallout with the Western society, and more interestingly, how it's going to renew its relationship with capitalism. The biggest contradiction is, of course, Dugan's rejection to communism. Dugan doesn't believe the classless communism utopia, and he pointed out Marxists have failed to predict where communism would occur. However, very interesting to note that Dugan has found a certain positive side of communism, which is that it showed the totalitarian side of liberalism before any other ideology. As for China, is China still a communism state? On secular levels, many no longer see Marxism or communism propagandas in Chinese people's daily life, and many believed that China is one of the most capitalism-friendly country nowadays. However, communism still underscores Chinese central leadership's political theory and ideology. One of the major reasons is that communism makes Chinese Communist Party's historical continuity legit. As we know, China has just celebrated its the Communist Party's 100 years anniversary, marks it the oldest standing p- party in modern history, alongside North Korea's. And if you still doubt it, the data is definitely telling us so. You may or may not have heard of Chinese Central Party schools. 
are state-run institute chains that designated teaching Marxism and communism doctrines, and it is a breeding ground of party members who are to serve the one-party government in China. Today, there are about three thousand Chinese university, and just recently, people are starting to notice that a number of Chinese party schools are surpassing Chinese universities. In the meantime. Russia's relationship with communism is a very nuanced subject in China. For example, in 2016, Putin vocally denounced Soviet founder Lenin, accusing him of placing a time bomb under the state, which won quite some coverage by Western media. In 2022, right before the Beijing Winter Olympic, before his trip to Beijing, Putin made a public statement: "Congrats, Gorbachev." On his 91th birthday, this news received little to zero coverage inside China. So it is reasonable to believe that Dugan's rejection to communism will remain untouched or little discussed inside China. As for Dugan's objection to globalization, that is a very interesting front. China. Economically, is apparently one of the biggest beneficiary of globalization, with its GDP managed to grow into the second largest one in the world. And not long ago, Chinese assets are considered the most desirable asset class in emerging market by many Wall Street investors. But all of this received a sharp stop around 2020. Events like Ant Financial's IPO saga, DD's recent delisting from American stock exchange. From a she's cracking down on Chinese real estate developers to big tech like Alibaba, it all signals a change. Towards end of 2021, many feared Evergrande, China's largest real estate developer, its default would cause collateral damage to the economy, and believed she would bail it out. She didn't do exactly that. Instead, many Chinese government offices received guidance from Beijing, indicating that. In order to prevent chaotic reactions to recent event referring to Evergrande's default, governments should prevent offshore Western capital exploiting the situation by buying Chinese assets at its bottom. In other words, Xi's priority, even in the moment of facing economic collapse, it is to eject Western capital to intervene Chinese market. This is very different from the time, if one still remembers, when Russian Ukraine war broke out. Ruble dropped to the bottom. Within 24 hours, when the sanction was announced, American investment banks such as Goldman Sachs and Chase already placed their purchase in Russian assets, including bonds and corporate bad debts. It seems she is very keen to rejecting those market intervention or manipul- manipulation. That tells President Xi is on a long haul in correcting how capitalism is going to play out in China. This is probably why Dugan wasn't invited to China until 2018, roughly five years after Xi assumed his power as president of China, because Dugan's philosophy might not be welcomed by leadership president to Xi's. How Dugalism is going to be embraced in China is still unfolding. However, by analyzing its contradictions and alignments with Chinese orthodox ideology, I came to the conclusion that Dugalism is going to be largely welcomed than criticized in China. The reason is that China, as a powerful nation state, its leadership has never come up a value system as part of its foreign policy that can compete with Western style of ideology. And Dugalism is a toolbox to do just that. Today, if America, Russia, and China are the three pillars of the world's geopolitical power map, China is the only one doesn't have an organic ideology play. Post World War II, Americans' value system, or in Dugan's term, American-style peak liberalism, was a beacon to the Western world. Aided by its grand strategy in building military alliance among Western nations, America managed to become the world's dominant power. Russia, while weak in economy, still recovering from the Soviet Union's collapse and largely rejected by the West. However, its Euro-Asianism-centered ideology, and as the largest Eastern Orthodox nation-state, 
Armed by its military prowess, Russia remains influential among its neighboring states, and the neo-Eurasianism as an ideology, masterminded by Dugan and other Russian intellectuals, have won notch footing in many populations, whether the West like it or not. As Dugan indicates, an illiberal state is a weak state in today's world order. While China rejects Western style of liberalism, it doesn't have an alternative one to play an offense. Rather, it constantly found itself playing defense. In that sense, China is a weak state, not because of its illiberalism, but because it lacks one to replace it. What China has? If we look at China's 30 years journey opening to the world, China has accomplished as a world's factory, an irreplaceable part of world economy. Then it embraces Wall Street-style capitalism and minted many new Chinese millionaires or even billionaires. But its wealth disparity remains alarmingly large. China has come to realize that its economy is more or less parasitic to the Western global market. As a nation state, it doesn't have a grand strategy to put it on an equal footing to America. In some sense, not even to Russia. But only until the Belt and Road Initiatives, or formerly known as One Belt, One Road, 一带一路 the progression of China's Belt and Road Initiative puts American dominant power system unnoticed for its first time. Although not surprisingly, it received a pushback and negative reviews from China's domestic economists, and no need to say from the West. But as a foreign policy, the Belt and Road Initiatives is probably the only grand strategy that China can call it an offense to the Western dominance. Now, China needs a value system or ideology play alongside its first time ever foreign policy that's in parallel to America's. And Dugalism came to an ideal choice to shape such system, not because Dugan's philosophy is a perfect match. In fact. It contradicts Chinese Communist Party's orthodox ideology in so many ways, as discussed earlier. But it is perfect, as Dugalism is an open system. It does not emphasize any specific premises, as scholars such as Chad Hag and Michael Minerman both pointed out. Just as how Chinese government likes to claim that. China has built its political theory on "quote unquote" socialism with Chinese characteristics. I came to believe that we will soon see dualism with Chinese characteristics, and this concludes this episode of Tech and Borders. I welcome any feedback or comments you have. If there is any specific topic you like to discuss, please feel free to reach out to me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Tech and Borders.